When the Wright brothers made the first heavier-than-air powered man flight in 1903, the world was amazed. Well, mainly. Because there were quite a few people out there who had been working on the problem for some time, and some of those saw that first flight at Kitty Hawk and thought, meh, could have been better. And one of those folks was Alexander Graham Bell. Today we mainly remember Bell for inventing the telephone, but he was basically one of those people who would apply his genius to whatever caught his interest. Medical devices, clean burning fuels, what we would today call green energy, sound recorders and players, hydrofoils, the list goes on and on. Bell even created the Photophone, a wireless telephone that used beams of light to send a signal so that one person could talk to another over distance without cables. And it worked. Bell and his assistant demonstrated it in 1880, 20 years before the first voice radio transmission. But amongst all of the many interests that Bell pursued throughout his life, one of the most persistent was the dream of aviation. He once said that, From my boyhood, the subject of aerial flight has had a great fascination for me. And for Bell, the main focus was in kites. He experimented over many years with different styles and planforms, all exploring how to achieve the maximum amount of lift for the weight, and all with the idea of creating a kite capable of carrying a man. This led to him building experimental tetrahedral kites of great complexity, and also led to Bell concluding that the Wright brothers' biplane design was not the most efficient wing platform. Bell recognised that the huge lift potential of the tetrahedral kite meant that, theoretically, it would need less engine power to get airborne with people on board. He was soon to get a graphic demonstration of the lifting capabilities of his designs in 1905, when one of his kites, the Frost King, lifted its handler 10 metres into the air when it caught a gust of wind of only 10 miles per hour. Then in 1907, Bell did a couple of things that really sparked his impact on aviation. Working from his workshop and laboratories at his estate in Canada, in December of that year, he saw his first true man-carrying kite take to the sky, the Signet. This was a steerable tetrahedral kite whose wings were composed of 3,393 cells. On the 6th of December 1907, the Signet was towed across Brad or Lake in Nova Scotia by a motorboat for propulsion and piloted by... Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge of the US Army. Unfortunately, the aircraft would prove somewhat tricky to control and was effectively destroyed when it crashed into the lake on landing. Fortunately, Lieutenant Selfridge wasn't hurt, though that maybe didn't work in his favour, as he was killed the next year when flying with Orville Wright, making him the first person to die in an aircraft crash. But as for the Signet, well, despite the issues, Bell decided to rebuild it to an improved design with an engine, effectively his first aeroplane design. Rechristened as the Signet 2, this aircraft, equipped with a specially built V8 that produced 50 horsepower and a skid undercarriage, was ready for a test flight attempt in February 1909. But despite Bell's high hopes for the lift potential of the tetrahedral wing, the Signet 2 never managed to get into the air, the engine just not being powerful enough. The failure led to Bell switching his attention to a new design, the Oyanus 1, at least I think that's how it's pronounced. This was a tetrahedral triplane that was powered in a pusher configuration, with the standard for the time forward control planes. This attempted to fly in 1910, but ultimately the same result ensued, and the aircraft never got off the ground. There was then a slight delay in Bell's personal aviation endeavours for a couple of years as he went travelling and became deeply interested in the potential of the hydrofoil, another area that he would soon be putting his considerable energies into. But in March 1912, he returned once more to aerial endeavours with a rebuilt Signet, now designated as the 3, which was engined with a gnome gamma rotary engine that produced 70 horsepower and with a much smaller wing than the previous versions. With this, Bell hoped to finally get a viable version of his tetrahedral aircraft flying, but was once again disappointed. Several attempts were made in March 1912 to get the Signet 3 airborne, but it never managed to get the wheels more than a couple of feet off the ground. It then suffered a major structural failure during what ended up being its last flight, and came apart, fortunately not killing the pilot, 
John McCurdy, who would go on to set a number of aviation records and played an instrumental part in founding the Canadian aero industry. But with the failure, Bell seems to have given up on the idea and began to devote himself to other endeavours. But that is not to say that the legendary inventor's aviation efforts went to waste. Far from it. Remember how I said that in 1907 he had made a couple of impacts on aviation history? The first was flying the Signet. The second, and far more important one, was his co-founding of the Aerial Experiment Association, the AEA for short. The organisation was a meeting of some of the leading minds in infant aviation, all committed to working together to work out solutions to the problems with aircraft design, an attitude very much different from that of the Wright brothers, who made a very determined effort to monopolise the rights to aircraft manufacture and usage. The AEA, funded by Bell's wife, would produce a range of different designs by various builders in a remarkably short two-year period, adding considerably to the knowledge that would soon make aircraft truly viable. It would also give an introduction to the aviation business for one talented engine builder, who was brought in to create the special lightweight and powerful power plants that were recognised as being necessary if the new aircraft designs were to succeed. Glenn Curtis. Indeed, it was his VA engine that was used on the Signet 2, as well as on many of the other, more successful aircraft built by the AEA members. Curtis would go on to found his own rather successful aircraft company, and many of the other AEA members also played parts in the new aircraft industries. And this is Bell's biggest, and largely overlooked, contribution to aviation. His designs might not have worked, though I personally would be intrigued what results a computer model of his tetrahedral wing would show with the use of modern materials, but his vision of bringing together the brightest minds interested in the new field and encouraging them with financial, industrial and organisational assistance, as well as throwing in his considerable reputation to back up their endeavours, makes Bell one of the unsung early contributors to aviation. <laughs>